Hey there, guys. Thanks for coming in. Yeah, thanks for having us. It's always a pleasure, dude. What do you say we just hop right in, huh? Yeah, sounds good to me. Yeah, ready when you are. All right, starting at the very first page, we're recording the VO booth. All right? Nice and relaxed. And rolling. Sabra! What is that? I don't know. What, what even is that? I don't know. Sadu. <laughs> Hello, people of the interwebs. Hi, everybody. Welcome to this, I guess, now fourth episode. Yep, it is officially the fourth episode of The VO Booth. Well, I guess the second episode of The VO Booth, but the, the fourth, fourth episode, episode of Boothing with the VO Ness. <laughs> yes. Um, Anyways, I'm Austin Lee Matthews. And I'm Mark Allen Jr. And we are joined by our first ever guest. Give it up for voice actor and casting director extraordinary. It is Patrick M. Hi, guys. How's it going? Hi, Patrick. Hi. Oh, we accidentally booked Aaron Neville. Oh, yes. I'm, that's fuck. my bad. I, we always get those confused. All right, yeah. Aaron, get your shit out. Pick, pack, get, get on your bike. Okay. Get out of here. All, All right, right cool. Yeah, I'm you? so sorry. This is just a yeah. real shit show. It's okay. I'll, I'll see you guys later. It's beautiful. Oh, hey, Patrick! Hey, oh, my on? God, Glad he's here! Oh, whoa, who the hell fuck? is that guy out there? I don't know. I don't know. Some it's... fucking loser. So, all right, so, Patrick, huh. welcome to the VO booth. Well, thank you. You already did the introductions and everything? Yeah, I, Kind I, of, we, sort yeah, of. Yeah. yeah. We, yeah the people a, listening know who we are? We do this live. So, yeah. So, yeah. I mean... We should point out that this is being filmed in front of a live studio audience. Well, a live hotel audience, anyway. A live studio hotel audience of two people. Say, uh, hi, hotel audience. Hey, you guys. Oh, cool. I hate that guy. I know, seriously. Didn't we just kick And the out? other one's playing Outlast. <laughs> With <laughs> headphones Radical on. headphones on. I know. Um, radical. So, so, Patrick, why don't you go ahead and uh, introduce yourself for the guests who might not know who you are. Well, okay. I uh, do voice acting for a series on the internet like Yandere Simulator. I've also worked with famous YouTuber Afmau on Minecraft My Street. I'm in the Nintendo game Freedom Planet, with mm -hmm. what's also now under production for Freedom Planet 2. Mm -hmm. And I also do casting directing under the company called Shining Star, and we have currently done... Uh, the Mobile Mobile Heroes Arena and Heroes Charge, and a couple of other little small mobile games like Legendary Castle and uh, da, 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 da. oh, Legend of the Nine-Tailed Fox. Yes, and I am in Leg Legendary Castle. Yes, you are. Yes, that was fun to do. You're Blackbeard and Watson. Yes. Yeah. Well, they haven't put in voices yet, but who fucking cares? Yeah, from, so far, they only have the legendary voices, so it's the rare drops. You clearly weren't legendary enough. I know. But you're epic. You know, epic. I, you, sometimes you just gotta learn to be a little bit more epic. I should have upped my game and. No, you you were epic enough. You just weren't legendary. Yeah, you know, sometimes you just. You Perhaps know, you should also reach godlike. I should. Stop anyway. looking at me like that. <laughs> okay, they, we, we, they need to know how we're looking at you. They can't see us. Listen, I think that the listeners at home could feel the way I was looking at him. Probably. I'm that good an actor. And they probably also want to look at him like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, we've been at Anime Expo all weekend. It's been um, like almost six days. Yeah, this is... This is basically day six for us. This is the longest anime expo ever. Which is awesome. Yeah. I'm loving it. I'm just exhausted. <laughs> yeah. That's a lot of it's a lot of days. I actually took a break on day three. I just stayed in the hotel and was just like, fuck it, I'm gonna stay here. We might play Dungeons and Dragons or whatever. So I'm just gonna stay in the hotel. Yeah. I'm it's exhausted. How about you, Patrick? How you been enjoying the anime expo so far? Currently I'm on my current awake day of day five. Whew! I haven't slept well. But yeah. I'll manage and it's like, I haven't been to Los Angeles in, like, four years. Yeah, it's so. been a while. According to Mark, you actually slept pretty well. <laughs> he, I don't know that he slept well. He just slept loudly. Yeah. Yes. Well, you and I both did, apparently. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I had I had stereophonic surround sound snoring going on night one, and it was kind it of amazing. It sounded a little something like... <laughs> That's an accurate representation. Patrick just snored inward he never breathed out the entire night and Mark when he's asleep just actually verbalizes honk shoo honk yes, shoo yes. honk shoo it is true <laughs> I'm a combination of geese and whatever animal goes shoo 
So before we get into audience quest- uh, questions, I have a question I would like to ask you. Okay. And that question is, um, this is the first time that we've had a guest on here, and we talk about things a lot from inside the booth, but we don't really get to talk about things from maybe the outside of the booth, like the, the casting and direction side, and uh, so you've been, since you've been doing a lot of that recently... Mm-hmm. Um, why don't you give us a little bit of a uh, insight into what that's like? Like, what, what's the casting process like for you? It's a very interesting process because currently with a lot of the mobile games, I'm working with a second company that's actually currently based in China. So we actually have a deal going where they help me cast the English voices and I have to help them cast the Chinese voices. That's awesome. What's the interesting, I guess the rules are a little bit different there. Instead of doing the traditional audition process like we normally do for a lot of games down here, mm-hmm. they actually go through the roster's demos with looking at the character sheets and everything, and then like, all right, we believe that this character is ideal for this person. So usually it's either an immediate casting or we request samples from the actor themselves, usually about three or four lines, a couple of takes, then they just pick that, that they go with bleh, words. They pick that person, and then usually they do. They produce really quickly. So usually the voiceovers have to be done within forty-eight hours. I remember when Legendary, when we were recording for Legendary Castle or Castle of Legends, whatever it's called now. Mm-hmm. Um, when we were recording for that, like it was like one and done, and then the game was like out in like two weeks after that. Yeah, it was just like whoa, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that process is very similar to how they do things in Japan as well. So yeah. I think I think just in general, in on um, I want to say like the eastern part of the world, that seems to be kind of the way they do it. Yeah, almost like it's an agency where you just kind of you peruse the talent that you have available and go, okay, well this person's good for these roles. It certainly and, was. It feels like, and it's and you're no longer the first. Well, you're no longer the only like company I've worked with that does it that way. I mm-hmm. recently worked with another company that I can't say what it is yet because mm-hmm. it's not out. Um, but they just listened to my demo, yep. and they were just like, hey, so you're going to come in and record for these three characters, have fun. That does seem <laughs> to be what happens when um, I get involved with casting for, like, I just call them Gachapon games, because that's basically what it is. Mm-hmm. It's collect the heroes, and the heroes do things sometimes, so it's just like one actor will end up getting, like, six roles, but each of the roles maybe have, like, one to three lines. And that's how it was with Monster Strike when I came in, because they just like were like, hey, so you're going to come in, you're going to record for 20 characters, yeah. just just go for it, and whatever comes out comes out, honestly. Yeah, yeah and, Rune Story was similar to that as well. Yeah. The, we, I went in, it had a different name when we recorded for it, but I went in knowing I was doing two roles, and I ended up doing, like, six or seven. Yeah. Don't remember what all of them were, but again, it was, like, three to five lines, just sampling kind I'm, of things. I'm glad that those gotcha games are kind of catching on over here, because I've always been a big fan of the Monster Collection games, and that's just the Monster Collection on crack. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I, it, those are games are so easy to get addicted to. Yeah. Um, but it's, like, fun building, like, your own little personal armies just out of, like, the randomized characters you can get, so yeah. I can see the appeal. Well, I, I know that Monster Strike is coming to a close here pretty soon, and so they've just decided, hey, as you know, a parting gift. If you log in like once a day, we're gonna give you um, fifty orbs to get all of these like high level characters that you maybe didn't get while the game was like running normally. Have fun with your guaranteed five star and up characters. And you yeah. just you just got one of your guys. Yeah, I, that was how I ended up finally getting Phantom. Yeah. I'm really happy. I'm gonna I'm gonna try and level um, rank him up to uh, Chainbound Phantom because. He has my favorite of all the lines I recorded for that. Nice. Yeah, and the other thing when it comes to, like, applying for, like, casting pools like that, it's a lot of a lot of rookie VAs also tend to send, make the same mistakes as they do when they're just auditioning for a project. Usually the golden rule is submit your material, forget about it, and just wait for a callback. But you, I, I imagine, get lots of people going, hey, just checking in to I'm see if Currently, you at thing. the moment, I think in the past three months, I've gotten ten messages from people saying, hey, have you listened to my stuff yet? So, hey, guys, here's just a little tip. Don't do not do that. Yeah. Please, yeah. please don't do that for the sake of my sanity. <laughs> if you send a director your demo, it's generally a good idea to just kind of send and forget. And yep. maybe, maybe check up on them. But I, like, I would say even give them a month 
Yeah. Honestly. I would say maybe even longer. <clears throat> yeah. Depending because, on the director. And depending on the time of year and, yeah. and you know. Because, like, currently my situation is I have 40 plus talents and I'm still working on three other projects. So I just really haven't had time to sit down and listen to, like, anybody's new material. Yeah. And it's one of those Let things. alone give feedback. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, there's a lot of those. It's just like, it's almost become obvious, and like there's certain things that just need to be improved in a demo. It's just like you can put a little more oomph on this. Why is this character saying that? But you know, I think that's a given with just every demo that's out nowadays. Yeah, awesome. But I had a question for you. Okay. Um, when in in terms of working from a position of a a casting company or a production company, mm-hmm. what do you normally look for in terms of projects that you're going to kind of uh, I guess, contact people saying, hey, I would like to help you with this project, or in in other words, kind of perusing what's out there and choosing the projects that you want to work on. I look at the, um, I look at the trending market, like, on mobile apps nowadays, because that seems to be, like, the biggest push with a lot of small independent companies is to go on iOS or Android. Mm -hmm. So I see what's trending, and, like, as we mentioned, Gatchapon games are the ones that definitely seem to be trending as of late. And a lot of, like, puzzle strategy games, like Fire Emblem of Heroes was really popular. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, there's these guys down in Anime Expo called Terra Battles, and, like, I was completely fascinated by that game. So I look at companies like that, that have a great character roster. You can add multiple voices into it. And it's a game that you know people are going to play just because it has, like, the small satisfaction of doing right. quick and easy actions. Something they can pick up quickly and yeah. play for a little bit and put down. Yeah. And the other one that I look for, um, just pretty much anything that's just quick and simple that we can, like be efficient with like the voiceovers because that they're looking for the stuff in 48 hours I'd like to give my actors just a little bit of time before they can actually send the material out it's like take time you need it's six lines get them in when you can but just get them within the deadline because mm-hmm. I want them to sound great even though the game is being made on a very fast time frame right mm-hmm. so there's a lot of shuno right. games are like that um, I actually cast for a game called Flight Nights by Line Corporation and that was essentially what it was Is you did that? yep nice yeah that was me nice 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 yeah, that was much easier to cast for because that was only five rolls instead of like sixty. Instead of ninety-seven thousand. Yeah. Sometimes they'll they have talents on the roster that aren't on mine, but they are contact with some English VAs. Like there's a few that we know that are on their rosters that they usually contact. So it's just like send them the stuff. <laughs> I know that you're also really good at kind of pulling out, um, like, when you do the hands-on direction, because you're, you're pretty good about letting actors for those games do kind of hands-off, but when you do the hands-on, um, the, the the couple times that I've done that with you, you're very good at kind of pulling out some good reads from actors, Thank you. and that also kind of helps those games have a little bit of, like, yeah. a, a slightly higher quality than they might have otherwise. Yeah. For, and the key for me is directing. I like letting actors feel fluid with how they do things. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a sci-fi shooter game that I uh, I had to do live for directing for, and one of the girls was having a little hard time just trying to... She didn't want to do lines on her own, and she <clears throat> didn't have anybody to read back and forth with her, so I did them with her. And I think doing that actually helps is when the director does the opposite lines for you. Mm-hmm. It kind of gives them an actual natural response, because if you have somebody yelling at you like, in pure anger, chances are you might actually clash back. Right. Mm -hmm. Another thing that, as both an actor and a director, I have experienced is that a lot of times, especially in VO, people are recording by themselves. They don't necessarily know who they're playing against. Mm -hmm. And as the director, your job is knowing how that that person's performance is going to fit in with everybody else's and how it's going to play out in the scene. So if you are the, then reading the the opposite lines or, or the other lines that are missing, you're giving that actor that that invisible person to to bounce off of exactly and it, and it entices a more organic or fluid like you said performance yep. and austin has noticed this with me when i direct i also <clears throat> do the numbers game where it's i don't want everything to be a solid 10 because a game that's just with constant 10 extreme emotional yelling and everything like that like it's boring or a little over the top so mm. we got i pretty subtle love the numbers that. game yeah, the numbers are great like so Austin in the booth would give me a seven, and I think that'd be good. But then take two and take three would probably be like a four or a six, where it's more about subtlety than it is extreme. Mm-hmm. And that also helps for like when you go outside of the ten scale. Yeah. Because um, I was working on a game last August. Wow, that was almost a year ago. What the hell? Um, 
that they had me on the numbers system, and they're like, okay, for um, for most of this, you're going to be at about a three or a four when you are like announcing the character names and stuff like that. Um, but then when you do more of the callouts, they're going to be at sixes, and we're going to keep building up from sixes to sevens to eights to nines to tens. And when we got to the tens, they're like, okay, you may notice that there's one more line on here. And I'm like, yeah. Um, which level do you want that at? They're like, well, you did it just at a 10. Um, and that was very, very good. This is about as intense as we can possibly get with this. We want a 16. And I'm just like, all right, cool. Time to not talk for three days. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> Yeah, there, there are a few projects where you can go beyond 10s. There was uh, one that I directed and also recorded for. We are a very intense scene. I don't know if the project ever got finished, though. It was a shame, because this came out so good. Um, like, solid 13s or 14s. This was Ooh. sort of, like, massive argument while there was, like, gunfire and everything around them. In case that hasn't been... If somebody's behind or not catching on... What we're kind of talking about is levels of intensity in terms of your delivery. Mm -hmm. um, playing the numbers game kind of means that you're working within a certain scale to kind of determine whether something's going to be delivered less intense or more intense. Yeah. The, the intention behind the acting is still there, but you can have a difference in performance based on whether something is subtle or overt, whether somebody is, uh, you know, if they're mad, people get mad in different ways. Sometimes yeah. they're slowly seething in anger, which would be like a two, three, maybe a four. Yep. Or sometimes they're absolutely raving mad, which would be your nines or yeah. tens. So, so having if, that number... If you need some show mean. examples, like three or four <coughs> intensities would be a show like Cowboy Bebop. Right. Yeah. A show that has level eight or nine or ten intensities are like Gurren Lagann, Dragon Ball Z, yeah. Kill a Kill. Yeah. Kill a Kill was between 8 and 10 the entire time I was recording that for the uh, show. Yeah. I, I would say watching that show, it's, it, I don't think anything really ever goes below a 6, except with maybe Ragio. I think yeah. Ragio is about the only person who goes below yeah, Ragio is just a solid 8 throughout the, whole <laughs> show. the entire show. Also, also, I don't know if we said this up front. Um, this is really explicit, so you can say the fuck word if you want. Oh. <laughs> fuck yeah. <laughs> Um, so the first audience question we're going to take, we've actually had this question before, but I actually really like this question. We answered it, we had a lot of fun answering this one, so I'm going to ask it to you. Okay. And it's from uh, What This Friendship Likes, and she asks, um, if you could spend an hour talking to one voice actor, living or dead, one-on-one -on -one without interruption, um, who, would, who would you meet with and why? Mel Blanc. Mm-hmm. Mel Blanc, in the um, decades that he has done work, has mainly been the sole voice for Looney Tunes sans a few additional voices for like extras or anything like that. I want to sit down and have a talk with him on how he was able to do that, how he was able to vocally run a whole show by his own voice, and how he was able to make every single character sound different. Like, vocally, you could tell right away it's Mel Blanc, but at the same time, you can hear a certain tone or personality and think, oh, that's Elmer Flood. Oh, that's Tweety. Yeah. Oh, that's Yosemite. And it's just like, where does the inspiration come from? Because there are some moments when it's just me that has to do a recording for a client or everything like that, and it's five characters, and they're all talking to each other. It's sort of like, I need to make sure that all of these characters sound completely different, or you can just tell personality-wise, like, that's that character. Right. So it's one of those, I think he would be a great person to talk to, and just a great person to have a casual chat with for mm -hmm. like an hour. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um... This first, this next question actually is our first Twitter question. Hey, hey. Um, and it's from Tyler M V A. Uh, that's at Optimist one four one five on Twitter. Uh, asks, uh, what inspires you to voice act? It's it, and this can either be present or past tense, I suppose. Present. Well, when I originally got into this, it was mainly because I was a theater student in high school, and I was very self-conscious of being on the stage just because of my weight at the time. It was fluctuating between healthy, chunky, to, oh my god, he needs to go see a doctor. Mm -hmm. So it was one of those, I felt too self-conscious of being on the stage. I'm like, alright, I really want to act, but I don't want anybody to see me until I can get all this fixed. Mm -hmm. So I was looking at alternatives and my acting teacher finally came up to me one day and said have you ever considered doing vocal acting like behind a microphone or everything where basically the only person who's ever going to look at you and your entire career is probably the director or you're just by yourself I'm like all right i can get on that that sounds good <laughs> <laughs> but after a while it became 
more of a need to do it. It's sort of like I loved cartoons. They grew up around them all the time. And just seeing kids nowadays, they get stronger life lessons from like cartoons and video games and everything mm -hmm. like that. So to be the messenger behind those themings and everything has just become a really a blessing in disguise, really. So I think that's what inspires me to keep going because I want it being that overall messenger of things are going to get better. That is a fucking great reason to do that. Yeah. I think we should answer that question too. Yeah, because that was that was yeah, that's right. That was a um, that was not a PMC or Seymour QA. That yeah. was a VO booth QA one. Yeah. How about you? Um, well, what inspired me to start was I'd been kind of just doing all these silly voices pretty much my whole life. Um, my, my mother describes me as um, making noises in the delivery room and also waking up from a dream uh, in a Bugs Bunny-esque voice screaming, You are a genius! And mother going like, What the fuck was that? And I fell <laughs> right back asleep. Um, and so I've just been like doing <coughs> stuff like that Getting in trouble in class for it, um, getting made fun of for it, um, getting praised by Australians for doing a flawless Australian accent when I was ten, <laughs> um, and just do, like doing stuff like that. And I wanted to be an animator. And um, for a while, I just kind of used like random sound effects that I found on the internet to kind of make my little shorts. Um, usually a stick figure stuff, like with Pivot Animator, um, if anybody remembers that ancient artifact. Um, <clears throat> and I decided I was going to do voices for my animations. Um, and so I aud auditioned for a Super Smash Brothers Machinima. Um, and Gosh, that was a while ago, wasn't it? This was 2009 in April, <coughs> April 2009. So this has been like eight years ago. Yeah. Um, and um, I, I did that to kind of build up, you know, for my acting for when I actually, you know, animated. Mm -hmm. um, kind of get like some more experience to get more comfortable. And after a while, I found that animation was tedious and boring, and I never was happy with the results. But I was far more happy with the results with voice acting. It was a lot more instant gratification, and I had just had a lot more fun with it being more open. It felt like more like that was my calling. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, I was inspired to start doing it professionally, um, after Anime Expo 2011, um, when I made the finals of VX Idol, and now what inspires me to do it is it makes me happy. Um, it keeps me going. It's basically it, it, it has made my depression just a very minor inconvenience sometimes. When for the last couple years it had been just this raging beast. And now I can count maybe on one hand the amount of just, like, depressive episodes that I've had in the last few months because voice acting has just gotten so exciting for me, and I kind of want to help share that happiness that's given to me with other people. It's beautiful, man. Yeah. yeah. Uh, for me, <clears throat> what kind of started this whole journey for me, even as a kid and, and uh, as a young upstart child in my family, school, community, whatever... Um, for me, I always enjoyed making people laugh and getting a smile uh, on somebody's laugh, face. Um, and it, it didn't really matter how I did it. Um, I was doing slapstick comedy before I knew what it was. Mm -hmm. I, I, I wasn't really doing a whole lot of voices as a kid, but it was, it was a lot of witty banter. Um, I, I give a lot of credit to my father in terms of uh, building me into a, a verbose and talented debater. Um, and utilizing those kinds of abilities in terms of how to communicate with people and, and getting into a, a, a dialogue and back and forth in driving conversations with people. Um, and when I discovered that those cartoons that I loved as a kid, people actually got paid to provide those voices, I said, oh, I, I got to do this. Um, and it just it created this avenue of expression that was totally different from anything else that I had done. Um, and it allowed me to provoke reactions and and incite emotion in people in ways that I couldn't do just as myself, whether in person or on stage or on camera or anything like that. 
uh, being able to just utilize the tools that are presented in a script and breathe life into a character and and create these moments of unique and uh, really visceral emotion and, and reaction between the audience and the creative work that they're experiencing, being a part of that process is just absolutely amazing to me. It really is. Um, I feel very lucky and fortunate to have those opportunities. Uh, in terms of what inspires me now, it's people like you guys. Um, Austin and Patrick both kind of started doing this after me, um, and there are a lot of people in my circle of both colleagues and friends uh, who started doing voiceover after me. And it's interesting to see how everybody's journey takes them to different places and, and everyone comes from a different past, but we all are, are cogs in this ever-turning wheel of creativity and expression and and seeing the kinds of things that people who maybe five years ago didn't even know that voiceover was a job they could they could do, mm-hmm. seeing the kind of things that those people are now doing and the kinds of things that they're they're capable of of bringing to the table is just it's it's absolutely fantastically awe inspiring and I love watching guys well I love watching you guys work and I love sharing in your guys' joys and 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 experiences as you progress it just it's such a wonderful uh, uh, puzzle to be a part of I think that's something that we can uh, kind of all agree Absolutely. is a very big you know aid in what helps us keep going with mm-hmm. this it's whether you guys not realize it the voice acting community is actually rather small so a lot of us have become very tight knit with each other oh so. yeah it's gotten bigger over the last few years but still a lot of us there it's pretty tight I'd mm-hmm. like to think that maybe 10 years ago because I've, I've been doing this for a decade now Ten years ago, we were we were like a can of twenty sardines, and I think now we're like a five gallon tub of sardines. But yeah. we're, we're packed just as tightly. Yeah. So there's more of us, but we all still end up knowing each other very closely. And for the most part, we all want to see each other succeed. There might yep. be like like the the odd one out is always the person who wants to see themselves like on top of everyone else. Yeah. Um, those are always the ones who are that either don't make it or make it in a different way that kind of isolates them? I would say and in in a way that everyone is aware of. Yeah. I think there are a lot of, and I don't don't want to call them black sheeps, but I think there are a lot of performers, especially in VO, who have a little bit of that weird Hollywood actor mentality Mm -hmm. um, and see themselves as as being first and foremost or more important than everyone they work with. Yep. And usually that that gets picked up on by the people they work with. Mm -hmm. So while they may be capable and and sometimes even rather successful in working frequently, that kind of relationship is not something that most of us want to sustain. Yeah, And that usually usually gets picked up on by anybody who meets those kinds of people. So... And it's like you said, we all want everybody to succeed. That's why the actor to the director turnover is so great mm-hmm. in terms of in the in the VO world. So many people who started as voice actors 20, 30 years ago are now directors. And so many directors are going to pick the actors who they want to work with and who they would, you know, get a coffee with afterwards. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Like you don't want to pick somebody who's just going to be like, you know, that a-hole who walks in to like the green room, eats all of the snacks, uh, <laughs> de- 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 dema- demands, you know, the interns to, um, you know, gr- grab them a Perrier from that 7-Eleven seven miles away. Fresh, walk, fresh grind the grounds wa- wa- for their cup of coffee. Walk into the booth, badmouth the the uh, the PA. Yeah. And no one's gonna want to be with that person. And the person who you know like goes on you know like t- like so- social media and shouts at directors like saying like Hey, why aren't you casting me in this shit? Yeah. Like that's st- like I don't get that mentality. It's, it's- yeah, you kids might notice it every so often. There's usually a few bad apples that, on one hand, will bash a company for the dubs they do, but also at the same time, ask for work from them. Yeah, yeah. it's it's not a good practice to present yourself in such a light um, because we all want to work, we all want to succeed, and but at the end of the day, it is still a business. Mm-hmm. So as, as much as we want to help each other out, we have to be able to have the kind of relationship that says, I understand that we're not working together on this project because for some reason that connection is not what's right for this project Mm -hmm. without it becoming this personal thing. There are plenty of things that Patrick has worked on that I'm not a part of. There are a few things that I've worked on that Patrick's not a part of. 
but we've bo- both been a part of each other's things. Yeah. yeah. It's just a matter of what's right for the project and what you're, you know, in terms of what you're working on, what's going to give, what's going to present the best product at the end of the day. And none of us are going to take that personally. And and if you want, like, an example of, like, a, a really good way to interact with the director, like, I was at a new studio that I had not worked with before just this Friday. Hey, I'm work- on a working vacation. Um... And I, I walked in, and I was just like, you know, like, hey, how's it going? And, you know, she was um, super, like, frantic because they didn't realize that there was nobody at the front to let me in. And I'm just like, hey, it's no big deal. I'm here. You're here. It's cool. We're good. And then, you know, I, I walked in, sat down, and um, just like, hey, do you want to audition for this, too? And I'm like, yeah, sure, why not? And just was just friendly with them, talk with them about, you know, stuff that would probably interest them. I saw that, you know, um, she had a, um, a Batman comic on her desk. I was like, I was like, who's the Batman fan? And we talked about comics for a bit. And then I walked into the booth and, um, we just, you know, had fun. That's just how you, you do, you just act like a person. You treat people like people. Yeah. It's the most important thing. for that up and down when it comes to conversations with new people or people you're actually trying to get like in touch with, like as a professional, don't approach them like with the certain. The certain need of like I need things from you. Yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah. Approach them and just talk to them like a normal person. That's, That's I think one of the most interesting things about like for example this convention, Anime Expo. There's so much industry function going on. There's so many industry personnel that come to this kind of convention, a convention of this size, uh, and there I think I feel that there are some people who have this, oh, this is my chance to get in with so-and-so. Mm-hmm. Whereas the the way to really go about that thing is let it happen organically. Yeah. If you bump into someone and say, oh, it's, it's so great to see you. You know, I've been a fan of your work for a long time. Or like, oh, you know, we've never gotten the opportunity to work together, but it's great to see you. Hopefully, maybe we'll get the opportunity in the future. Yeah. You don't you don't want to drive that too hard, especially yeah. at a convention like this. And if you want to hand out like a business card or something like that, Talk to them organically about what they do. Right. Ask and say, hey, do you have a business card? Maybe we could do an exchange of cards. Mm-hmm. Like, don't just say, hi, I'm an actor. Here's my card. Or, hey, I do a YouTube review show on anime, and here's my card. Um, I'm totally not calling anybody out with that one. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm sorry about that. Oh, he's choking on the irony. Oh, man. It's, it's just amusing, like, how many people force themselves in those situations and then absolutely realize in the end that they're not ready to yeah. go that next step. Yeah. And another tip that uh, to chime in with Austin on just, like, having casual conversations, it's at a game company. Uh, a good friend of mine and a good friend of Austin's, Tiana Camacho, actually does this Woo! when it comes to uh, video game demos. Play the demo first. Yes. Give them notes, what you think of it, how you like it, everything like that, and then do the business card exchange. I actually got to do that last Tuesday, Yay. and that made me really happy. I was invited to a studio for, to, on a game that I worked on and um, ended up actually having to do the... Um, Here's what I liked. Here's what could have been fixed. And then to finish it off with what I really liked, mm-hmm. I got to I got to do the sandwich. It made me really happy. Yes. But I will say that game is freaking fun. <laughs> I was re- I'm I'm really excited to be part of that. It's coming out. I think really 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 soon. really, really yeah. thi- like okay. Th- that game's gonna be out at some point between this and the next episode. Probably. Like, yeah. I can say Probably. that with confidence. Yeah. And one last thing I want to add on this before we maybe move on to the next question. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, just understand, like we said, we're a very close-knit society. Um, and that unfortunately means that word travels very quickly. Um, so if somebody does something inappropriate or somebody uh, approaches someone in a very unprofessional manner, mm-hmm. everyone is going to know. Mm-hmm. Especially, like I said, at a convention of this size. Oh, if yeah. you do something on day one everybody's going to know about it by day three. Yeah, um, honestly. So definitely treat people like people. Don't don't look at it as your opportunity to score. Yeah. Part of networking, everybody knows that that's part of it. Yep. There's that weird, awkward moment where everyone's like, okay, we're networking now. This is that thing where like, I don't want to look like I need to use you. I don't want to look like I need you to use me. But if you start those conversations as conversations, just... 
hey, oh, did you catch this movie? Or, hey, you know, what are you up to these days? That's going to create a dialogue that is something normal people have. And so it's not just straight up, hey, I'm looking for contact information. You're getting to know that person and seeing if that's someone you actually want to associate with. And at conventions like the one that we're at, you have the benefit of at least thinking, having the knowledge that you might have at least something in common because if you're at like an anime convention you know, you can say like, hey, like what's your favorite anime? Or do you even like anime? Do you, uh, you know, like what's your favorite part about working on anime, mm-hmm. etc. You have something in common. Mm-hmm. Um, and that- going going to panels, you're going to run into industry personnel walking to and from those panels. And yep. You see someone leaving a panel that exactly. you're leaving, you get to talk about the panel you just witnessed. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. There's so many opportunities to start a regular, normal, organic conversation, and I think that should be your focus. Yeah, honestly. And if the business stuff comes into it, great. But I would say don't drive that, especially not if this is the first time you're meeting that person. In terms of every sort of salty Overwatch player, don't be a diva. First of all, I'm a diva main, so you need to back up. (laughs) Everyone hates the character I main. It's me. (laughs) It's gonna be me! (laughs) Um, Anything else to add before we can move on to the next question? I I think we stretched that question as much as we could. (laughs) I think we spent 15 minutes on that question. Um, this next one comes also from Twitter. This is from Kevin Koto. Um, I'm pretty sure Kevin Koto VA at, yep. at Kevin Co- at K Koto VA uh, on Twitter. Hi Kevin. Um, uh, he asked. Well, he hashtagged it PMC more QA and also Q- VO booth QA. So I guess we can all answer this. So we have one. to fight to the death to see who answers first. All right, all pa- right. Patrick, you take uh, the chipmunk. Mark, you can take the blue uh, red panda, All right. and, and I will take this purple fox, and we are going to throw them at each other on the kind of not we're not doing that. Yeah, um, it's a what's your favorite and least favorite character to voice? We've already kind of answered this bit, question. Yeah. Um, I mean, we could maybe talk about some other ones, but let's point it at you first because they did <laughs> specifically point this one at you. Yeah, I really enjoy like doing characters where I can step out of my common zone where it's usually the characters have some sort of like tone around my natural voice like doing like the deeper ones or the very high almost falsetto fluty type of voices yeah uh least favorite probably has to be just like anything that really has no personality to it whatsoever uh, unless it's like a robot character but if there's like a character that literally there is no actual description of what the character is, how they interact, or anything like that. It's just like, I'm shooting in the dark here. I don't know what to do. I don't know what you're talking about. I love playing cardboard. <laughs> <laughs> it's like board game based cardboard. <laughs> <laughs> um, when we had it, we had a question like this similarly before that. I think was like, who was your favorite? What was your favorite role or something? Yeah, like I think that. that was from Haley. Uh, um, and I usually talk about Motor. Uh, from Clay Kids. Um, Motor is a character that I very much enjoy playing. Um, kind of started my uh, descent into playing nerdy characters. Um, and I think it's just because it's something that I can do realistically without necessarily being, you know, uh, condescending or insulting. Um, but th- <laughs> I agree with you in that I enjoy playing characters that are outside of my norm. Um, and this weekend, I had the honor of, uh, for the first time, picking up a figure of a character that I voiced some three or four years ago now. Yes. Um, uh, he's, he's sitting on the counter over there, and I just keep looking at him all weekend. Uh, but uh, I, I played Ren Koha in Magi, the Kingdom of Magic, and this was a character that I don't normally get to play. He was a very uh, a high-born, noble, but also uh, sociopathic and sadistic guy. Um Lots of murder uh, that he enjoys doing. Um, He's not the nicest guy to people who are beneath him, and that's pretty much everybody. Um, But he has some redeeming qualities as well. I won't go into it because it spoils the show and things like that. But um, getting to just play somebody over the top like that and really drawing out of my comfort zone uh, was a lot of fun. And he's always going to have a soft spot in my heart, and I I was thrilled to finally be able to pick up a, fi- a figure of this character. So When you walked in and you're like, Austin! <laughs> <laughs> it happened! I was like, Rencoha? <laughs> and then you pulled it out and it was like, <laughs> I was really happy for you. Um, it's a milestone right there. To it, it, I, I, physical toy. It's like yourself. a long time coming, you know? It's been yeah. several years since I played that character and he's not very popular. 
Uh, at least in my experience, I, I, love I, I always miss miss the uh, cosplayers. Unfortunately, but. I like Ren Koha, but I'm probably biased because you're my brother. <laughs> Sorry, right, I'd murder you too. Um, I, I don't think. I don't think you murdered me in that show. I said I would murder you, not that I did. I know, but I'm just saying. Um, That's precious. My, <laughs> my, true love, guys. My true favorite love. kind of characters to play are obviously the really bombastic characters. Cause they I'm call just, me Mr. Bombastic. bombastic. Call me fantastic. Touch me on the butt, she says I'm Mr. Rose. Okay, oh. that's, that's... Hey, that's, that's how the song goes. That's, uh, I'm, just, I'm just playing the role, man. We, we, wrong Shaggy <laughs> for this show, I'm afraid. Um... But, um, yeah, I like playing, like, characters that are just, like, big and broad. Um, they're just, um, just, just, they don't always have to be, like, at, you know, a 10 in terms of their energy level, but they can be, like, kind of, like, snarky and just kind of, like, smart asses. I like playing characters that you get to have a lot of fun with and kind of be really, like, broad with your expressions with, yeah. the, with, with them. Mm -hmm. Um... I'm very lucky that I've gotten the chance to do that for, like, the last several months on this fucking game. Um, as far as characters that I... My least favorite characters, I haven't really encountered... Um, I haven't really encountered any characters that I have would say are, like, my least favorite. I would say maybe just, like, if anything, just characters that aren't written well... <laughs> So my um, beef. That's the thing is, it's like I feel like it's really hard to say as an actor that you have a least favorite character. I mean, yeah. granted, sometimes you get frustrated when you're locked into playing the same character over and over again. Yeah. But I think we we all kind of find a way to breathe life or mm -hmm. or bring something enjoyable to any character that we're playing. It's part of why we enjoy what we're doing. Yeah. So I, it, it's very difficult to look at any of the characters that I've played and say and say you know like oh, I really didn't like this character. Yeah. I can look at aspects of a character that I didn't necessarily like, like you said, kind of a, a poorly written character. Yeah, but. and even then, poorly written characters, I only I only dislike when I don't get to have fun playing the poorly written character. Yeah. Because, like, there's a difference between playing, like, you know, a character in the room and maybe playing a character in, like, a, a really... One of those, like, classic examples of bad video game voice acting mm -hmm. where it's just somebody talking like this. I'll you taste my go. arctic blast. Yes. Yeah, just, like, stuff like that. But there's a difference between that and, Die, monster! You don't belong in this world! There's, yeah. there's a difference. Yeah. Um, I would have had a fucking blast working on that. <laughs> um, and this is from at uh, Libby20056 on Twitter with a very, very serious question. <clears throat> Wield, um, I'm, I'm assuming wood. Gotcha. Uh, would you rather voice act uh -huh. or work for Cards Against Humanity? Oh, jeez. Oh, no. Oh, crap. I have oh. to rethink all my uh. life decisions. Like, is this is this an official offer? Because... I, I don't know. If um, they... If, if you... Was it... It was Libby? Yeah. Libby, if you actually work for Ka and, and like, you can make that happen, I I'm, will... I'm pretty sure this is very official because their uh, avatar is a picture of Sans readying a gastro blaster. So I'm certain I'm, that this is I, about as I, official as it can get. I am ready to jump ship. If you can get me an opportunity if to If you just... can get me next to the guy who wrote the biggest, blackest dick card... I will join. They dug a huge hole last year. I would totally pay. Right? Yeah. I forgot about that. I would yeah. pay to work with them. I would. I would. I would pay them. They wouldn't have to pay me. In in all seriousness, like, <laughs> so my degree in college was in linguistics, and I just love language and 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 wordplay. And I know Patrick has his puns, <laughs> which he's been tormenting us with all weekend. I've actually been enjoying it. Um, I'd say tormenting in the lightest way. Yeah. Um, I, I love what Cards Against Humanity does. I love the way that they've taken language and made it fun and just weird and kooky and exciting. So that kind of thing is super cool to me. If I could find a way to incorporate voiceover with that, I would. And, and Austin's played with me before. We read out the cards, and we, we yeah. have a oh, lot yeah. of fun with them. There's a couple that are worded like they're being spoken by an old-timey news radio announcer. There are a few that sound like movie trailers, and we always just go into voices when we do that yep. stuff. Um, so. I was pl I was live streaming with um, a few other actors. We're, I don't know if you were there, but when uh, with um, Lucas Schooneman when we were playing with him. Right, yeah. Um, I, were you there for that when he was like saying, okay, so... 
you are a old man yep, who admit. is reliving his days as a sailor. Yeah. And you're going to read this ca- this card and all of the answers like that go. And just shit like that yeah. is freaking fun as hell. It's good exercise, too. It really it is. It I need to do thinking out of the box. I really need to do stuff more like that with other acting friends. I want to try maybe do some more improv ac- 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 yeah. improv exercises. Um, and we started a D and D campaign, and <laughs> yeah. that these actually guys, these guys were on the improv game. Th- th- that that was actually a really nice improv exercise because I don't get to do stuff like that, so I had to really be on my toes. There were a couple of moments where I was like, uh, but that was mostly how I was like working out like what to how do. the game works. Like, yeah, that, like yeah, because we're, we're, I had never played before. Like working out how the game works. Like okay, how do I diffuse this situation? I, I always, because my character is a neutral good, she always tries to do things non-violently. She can get violent, but, ha- like, dealing with, like, you know, a giant orc holding an axe who wants to kill me. Um, how to defuse that situation without violence. Needless to say, it ended with me um, choking him out while somebody else shot him in the head. Um, it got graphic. But, like, you know, it was a very nice exercise. So, like, playing, like, you know, tabletop games with your friends, Dungeons and Dragons, doing improv exercises with your friends. That's definitely something that, to keep every, to keep you on your toes, because there's going to be maybe, like, a time in the, in, in the booth where a director says, all right, just maybe just, um, throw something out there for this. Because I remember at, at, Near the end of when I was working on this game I've been working on, he's like, alright, cool, so those are all the written lines, um, you've gotten kind of a handle on the character, just, um, just throw out some, like, maybe, like, some improv lines of just, like, some funny quips to say, uh, while you're flying around, because we already had a bunch of those, but they're just like, you know, if you can think of anything, and so, just like, hoo Uh, oh, shit, son! Like, so, like, you know, stuff like that. Um... Uh, but it's one of those things that that's also just part of the business yeah. is having to be on your toes. Yeah, this is this is a passion of ours, so we're gonna put that passion into just about everything. Mm-hmm. Um, Absolutely. And I need to take some actual like improv classes here pretty soon. Mm. So um, to answer your question, Libby, yes, on the condition we get to make funny voices while we do it. Well, her her question was a this or that question, so the answer is yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Um, this next question, I this one I'm going to direct at you specifically. Okay. Um, Fire away. This was uh, this is an older question that gotcha. we had. This is from Turn Tech God Hime, who we've had questions with from before. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is I'm going to kind of phrase it a little bit differently, but they ask um, how to run a project. Like speaking about like fan or original works, but I'm, I'm basically what I'm going to phrase that as: Do you have maybe some tips from for like aspiring directors on like maybe like on working with actors or maybe some like organization tips okay um the first tip I'm gonna give is uh schedule what day you're doing what so like for me it's usually every even day is alright I'm gonna do voiceovers today and then every odd day is like alright I'm gonna direct I'm gonna submit stuff I'm gonna schedule actors to go and do their lines and get them submitted or revise scripts because sometimes Lines are written weirdly that I'm like, we gotta fix that. Mm-hmm. So it's one of those, organize it, and then in terms of approaching uh, developers on like how to actually get the casting done for those, um, a very professional cover letter, a nice little email saying, hi, I've been checking out your work, and like I wanted to, as a curiosity, do you need any additional voiceover work, or do you need voiceover work in general for your project? I have a roster of this many people. We have a great range of uh, just age and tones and accents and everything like that. It's sort of just like putting an offer on the table, but it's not like a mandatory offer. It's just like, I'm just going to leave this here, and if you guys want it, I'll be over here. And so, yeah. you, so you don't tie them to chairs, Jack Bauer style, and say, if you do not sign this contract, I will destroy your family. Basically. Okay. That might I, be what I've been doing wrong. Because I tried that once. It doesn't work. Oh, yeah. Um, but I, I guess the final tip and just sort of and like working with actors if you're sort of new to the whole directing thing um, just 
do a whole no pressure session. Just like if you feel uncomfortable with guiding them, just let them run on their own. And if you just sit there as a listener and start to think, well, they could have said this a little bit differently. And just sort of like you're not looking at it as like you need to do this. You're sort of like realizing like that's great, but I wonder if you could say it this way. And then you sort of actually start to realize like this could actually work. If I can piggyback on that just a little bit, I think for those who are interested in getting into directing or casting in general, um, I would definitely recommend if you have the opportunity, if you know anybody who either does it online or you happen to be in an area where there is a, re- a studio or recording office. session or something like that, see if you can shadow them. Yeah. Um, I've had the opportunity to sit in on quite a few director sessions um, and just getting a feel of how other people direct. Mm-hmm. Um, bring a notebook with you and just take notes. Yep. Um, mm-hmm. Just take notes of, one, how the director's going to work with the actor, yep. two, how the actor responds to how that director works with them, because every actor is going to react differently depending on who's mm-hmm. directing them. There are some directors that, as an actor, I love working with and others that I have a harder time with just because the directing style is so different and some things click and some things don't. So it's a good way to kind of get an idea of yeah. just a broader sense of how those interactions yeah. work and, and getting and, an idea of what you might want to do. And definitely shadow multiple directors because every director will direct mm-hmm. differently. Yes. Working with Tony Oliver is a completely different ex- experience from working with someone like Patrick Seitz mm-hmm. or... Um, Tom, Alex Von David. Yeah, or Tom Keegan or something like that. And these like are all that. people who even work with the same studios on the yeah. same kinds of projects. Mm-hmm. So it's very important to have... A, a good range of ideas of how different directors work because you know in, in terms of formulating your own style and your own way of approaching things mm-hmm. um, y- it helps to have a, a foundation of other ideas to start with um, I'm gonna I think we have time for one more question okay. and this is actually a question from a good friend of ours um, squiggly diggly do <gasps> Haley Haley, Haley. Um, and this is this is one that I believe we've answered before, but I really like it, so I'm going to direct it at you. Okay. And it is, what is the dumbest thing you've done in the booth? <laughs> I really like this question. Um, okay. Um, I, I think this was actually pretty recent, because I had to record for a game, uh, Heroes Charge, who also does Heroes Arena, and the character for was a rather tall, monster-looking dude called Hercules, and he's also one of my favorite characters, because he's out of sight of my comfort zone, he's like, ten all across the board, so he's like, let's <laughs> bust some heads! <laughs> um, he, like... <laughs> Oh, he's scary. He had one line that's just like, this place is boring, I want to keep going, and like, Inside the booth, I was like, this place is boring, and I accidentally farted. <laughs> and then it said, I just want to go home. <laughs> I almost wanted to keep that in, because I think it actually works really well for how Hercules is designed. And it's just like, well, I can do that, even though this just is brilliantly executed. I think we've all had farted in the booth moments. My... <laughs> I'm really sneaky about my booth farts. If we can get, if we can really get into this conversation, yeah, let's um, do it. I, we, uh, well, I'll, you know, we'll have a special surprise at the end too. Yeah. I, have, I, have, I have gotten very good at at being able to stand or arrange myself in a way as to produce the least amount of sound. But but there, I, I think I've mentioned it a couple of times, either on this show or on other shows or in panels and stuff. But there was a time when. I believe it was Robbie Damon was going into the studio after me, and I almost wanted to leave a sticky note of apology because it was just—it was so bad. I was just—I had just discovered that I was lactose intolerant, and Ooh. it was—it was wrecking my oh, inte- no. intestinal tract. So it just—it was. I'm sure he did not have a good time. Um, I've never actually farted in the booth, so to speak, with like an actual an actual booth. Oh, really? I've I've had because um, I can I can provide recording. Well, otherwise. I was gonna, I said in the booth. <laughs> now I've had food poisoning in the booth before, and I've I've had oh. my stomach make noises before. However, working on Mass Effect Protocol, yeah, um, I'm going to do a demonstration of my of of what, what of my laugh, and you can provide the sounds if you like. Gotcha. So I I <clears throat> I, I said, all right, cool. Next line and. <laughs> It was like that. And then it was, are you done? 
<laughs> it was like that. It was. It, I was just like slowly dying <laughs> as, as it just. It, it was just like. I think. I think we kind of like ten slaps. It was, it was. It was ridiculous. It was just like. <laughs> yeah, it was bad. And, and uh. you were just like. Dude, what the fuck? I, 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 like when it started, I kind of wanted to laugh, but then it kept going, and I was like, "Is this like a serious problem? Like, I don't know if I should draw attention to this." Oh, I think I had a moment like halfway through, like, "Is this just life now?" <laughs> this is who I am. I accepted my fate. I am Austin Lee Matthews. I, I will say, flatulous to the king, and this is who I am. I will say that I am very glad that I am much more. Uh, aware of my body when I'm in booths because when I record auditions from home I have my microphone set up in my closet Mm -hmm. and I would say on average two to three times per recording session whether that's auditions or recording for a project uh, I find a way to assault my microphone Um, either I kick it or I punch it. Usually punch it. Usually it's because I'm getting into a line and it's kind of like, how dare you? I hit my microphone. I just, and uh, and li- I have I have probably days of recordings of me apologizing to my no. microphone. I just realized I was not a farting in the booths moment, but um, I had a moment of some some uh, very personal pain oh, no. when I. Um, I was recording for a, sh- a, a a show last year that I can't talk about with some ladies who I very much look up to who are also very good friends of mine. And I'm off to the far left, and uh, it's about maybe two hours into the recording session, and I realize, oh boy, I've really got a fart. <laughs> and so I'm just like, holy shit. <laughs> We're all in this very small booth, please don't, don't do it. And thankfully, I I had the self control, and I didn't <laughs> fart. But as soon as I walked out of the booth, <laughs> 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 full on Ace Ventura mode, huh? And I was very happy because I was done recording for the day, but they were still in the booth because they, I think they had still two more hours of recording. So there was left time for it to disperse. So it was just like, yeah, it was just like. <laughs> Oh, oh, I swear Lord. we're all very mature people, but no. you when you live in a booth, yeah. these things happen. Yeah. You oh, also get a little insane inside. <laughs> we're a little insane in the We membrane. literally spend hours of our days trapped in rooms with padded walls. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It just happens. That's why our last podcast was called These Walls Ain't Padded. Yep. <laughs> yeah. um, but for now, I would say... Let's call this an episode. I yeah, think. man. Um, it was very good having you on this episode, man. Well, thank you guys for having me. And it was good having you on this episode, too, Mark. Oh, thanks. Am I gone on the next one? It was good having you on this episode, too, Tim. Yay! <laughs> it was good having you on this episode, too, Terry. Who farted. Did you fart? Of course he did. <laughs> oh, no! Oh, cut. It was, it was silent, but it was there. Oh, cut. Ba-da-ba-ba-da-ba-da-ba-da-ba-da-ba-da-ba-da-ba-da-ba-da-ba-da-ba-da-ba-da-ba-da-ba-da-ba-da-ba-da-ba-da-ba-da-ba-da-